Uh, the presentation that I'm going to be making this evening uh, is uh, based on a uh, class that I teach on uh, temples in the ancient world. Uh, the title for this particular presentation, Who Shall Ascend into the Hill of the Lord, is based, uh, is uh, a, uh, taken from <clears throat> the uh, title of the book that was written by my late lamented friend, LeGrand Baker, who died just a couple of months ago, very um, unexpectedly. And uh, <clears throat> it, it is a reflection of our interest, not only in the Psalms, but in the temple itself. Uh, we'll be running through this, looking not merely at words, but also at images. Uh, let me uh, request, if you have any questions, rather than raising your hands, if you could just uh, uh, call the question out, I'd be uh, pleased uh, to try to answer it. <clears throat> uh, among uh, other aspects of the temple, the temple is the architectural embodiment of the cosmic mountain. Uh, <clears throat> This typology of the temple also notes that the cosmic mountain often represents the primordial hillock, the place that first emerged from the waters covering the earth during the creative process. This is all technical stuff, but we'll, we'll go on and note that what we find in Isaiah 2, two through 3 is, uh, helps us to see <coughs> that uh, Isaiah's uh, a description of uh, the temple as the uh, uh, place where they, the Lord's house uh, is, is set, as it were, as a kind of mountain. <clears throat> uh, we read in Isaiah 2, 2 through 3, it shall come to pass, uh, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow unto it. That's, uh, that's what we, we see. We see here, this is in, uh, uh, from ancient Mesopotamia, from the ancient city of Uruk, U-R-U-K, uh, a, a platform on top of which a temple was to be built. This is probably an artificial mountain on top of which the uh, temple uh, would have been built. The ziggurat itself is a kind of uh, uh, artificial platform on top of which and you see the very top the structure that reflects uh, the uh, temple you can either walk straight up which is a good aerobic exercise or you can uh, take some other stairs going up and then go up and around and uh, to the very top and into the temple itself uh, the temple mount is itself quite literally on the top uh, it is in uh, a mountainous area. And in fact, uh, Jerusalem is at around 2,700 feet in elevation. And if you go down from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, you go down about 4,000 feet in elevation because the Dead Sea is about 12 to 1,300 feet below sea level. Uh, here we see the Temple Mount, and you see this, a large building with a gold dome, that is the Dome of the Rock, which was built uh, on or close to the site of uh, the Temple uh, in Jerusalem, Solomon's Temple and uh, Herod's Temple. <clears throat> I think uh, that the uh, Temple that we find in Salt Lake may be a Latter-day uh, fulfillment of uh, the prophecy about the uh, Mount of the Lord's house, which is the temple w being established in the tops of the mountains. Not only was it fulfilled in Isaiah's day with the uh, temple in uh, <coughs> Jerusalem, but also with the, the temple uh, among the Latter-day Saints. Uh, <coughs> Joseph said about the blessings of the temple, the rich can only get the blessings of the endowment in the temple. Well, the poor may get them on the mountaintop, as did Moses. So uh, a mountain can be like a temple. And uh, <clears throat> going up a mountain is like going to the temple. Uh, when one goes into the temple, one successively ascends 
the temples and the Temple Mountain express the idea of uh, ascension toward heaven. Uh, in fact, as we look at this image of a ziggurat, uh, one has to go upward in order to be able to get to the uh, platform up above where the temple itself is located. It's right up at the top. And another image that we see, this is one, William Blake's uh, uh, image of the uh, dream or the vision of Jacob, sees Jacob uh, uh, down below and uh, he is uh, flanked by uh, angels uh, that are walking up and down. It's, even though uh, in later translations the word uh, has been rendered as uh, as <clears throat> as a, a ladder, in fact the Hebrew word sula means a staircase. So this staircase goes up and down, and this dream of Jacob of a stairway that leads to the throne of God is an image of the sort of a uh, thing that might have uh, existed with angels coming up, uh, going down. It's very much like uh, what we find in Lehi's vision uh, in which he saw uh, God on his throne and angels surrounding him. Uh, here uh, is another very interesting image of the, uh, of the Salt Lake Temple. And in the Salt Lake Temple we can see individuals who can successively go up uh, and inward into uh, the holiest place in the temple itself. In fact, one begins at a lower uh, level and continues upward until they get to the uh, final place, the uh, holy, not the holy of holies, but the celestial room at uh, the highest uh, level uh, in the endowment session. Here we. Here we see uh, an, Im an interesting image. This is taken from the Nauvoo Temple, uh, uh, which was rebuilt to reflect the fact uh, that this temple had a staircase that was not supported uh, by pillars on the inside, but which individuals are able to walk up. up. Again, a kind of, of successive upward movement uh, uh, toward uh, heaven, symbolically, <clears throat> May I, uh, just as a matter of interest, which temple in Utah has, uh, follows the same pattern, that is the pattern we have? The Manti Temple has a staircase that is not supported by pillars on the inside, very much like the Nauvoo Temple ha had. <clears throat> Joseph Smith's uh, writings that uh, were compiled as the teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith includes this statement. Paul ascended into the third heavens and he could understand the three principal rounds of Jacob's ladder, the celestial, the terrestrial, and the celestial glories or kingdoms where Paul saw and heard things which were not lawful for him to utter. Let's take a look at this. Here we see as uh, an illustration of the plan of salvation, uh, an image of uh, the Garden of Eden that includes uh, the uh, tree of life that we see up above uh, that tree, next to it the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and uh, we see waters that are flowing from uh, that mountain and going out into uh, the rest of the world. Uh, uh, representing uh, the, uh, the great rivers of uh, ancient uh, Near East at that time. Uh, flanking uh, uh, just right across from each other, we see uh, an image of cherubim and a flaming sword. That is to represent uh, a prohibition for uh, any of uh, Adam or his posterity to enter into the Garden of Eden itself. Uh, when uh, Adam fell, he was uh, uh, exiled uh, from the Garden of Eden and uh, was not able to go back except uh, 
just briefly according to one uh, apo uh, apocryphal account uh, in order to be able to get uh, some of the oil from the tree of life, which I am guessing may have been an olive tree and uh, was able to anoint himself with uh, this particular uh, oil. Now we see the, the fall uh, from the garden. The, the atonement is reflected in, in what we see uh, on this image on the right hand side, we see uh, uh, as a partition between the outside of the uh, tabernacle itself and the inside, cherubim. You have cherubim facing each other. Uh, the uh, individual is coming in from the east toward the west. They pass in between the cherubim, they go by the menorah, which, which represents the tree of life, and ultimately passed by other cherubim uh, on the uh, drapes that separate the holy place from the holy of holies um, in, and into the presence of God himself thus, where individuals uh, Adam uh, symbolically was uh, cast out of the Garden of Eden. Symbolically, individuals may uh, enter into the presence of God, uh, passing by cherubim and the tree of life into the presence of God himself in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a place for individuals to reverse the effects of the fall. And here we see an example of the uh, sites where God's word can be received. Uh, up on top we see the throne where God uh, sits enthroned. The two tablets we see on top of a mountain uh, with a cloud separating it. We have a revelation also received at the burning bush which is down below and uh, the fire of the altar is uh, another way for individuals to receive God's um, uh, to achieve uh, reconciliation with God and to uh, go into his presence. Let's pass into this uh, next section. The temple is associated with the underworld, the realm of the dead, the afterlife, the grave, or a cave which often accompanies the sacred mountain. Uh, in the 128th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, we read, the baptismal font was instituted as a similitude of the grave and was commanded to be in a place underneath where the living are wont to assemble thus. The baptismal font should probably be at or below the place where the living are wont to assemble and normally that is the case <coughs> too. The temple is often associated with the waters of life that flow forth from a spring within the building itself, or uh, the temple is viewed as incorporating within its earth, having been built upon such a spring. We, we see here an image of the <coughs> baptismal font uh, in the Salt Lake Temple. It's uh, constructed, uh, mounted on the backs, of 12 uh, oxen representing the 12 tribes of Israel. This particular font is in a place uh, about a floor or two below where the, uh, the, those that, that wish uh, to receive their endowments or uh, to do temple work uh, uh, assemble. And from there they move uh, upward. Another point is the temple is associated with creation. Creationists are often recited and reenacted as part of, the temp of temple worship. Um, the temple rituals further often make specific reference to the creation of the world or to the procreative and creative processes. Uh, and Nibley has said that creation is central to the worship of ancient temples and other sacred places. Ancient temples, he says, rehearsed the story of creation and the establishment of mankind and the royal government of God upon this earth. <clears throat> I should note that while there's some uncertainty about the use of Genesis creation text in the Jerusalem temple before the exile, 
there is compelling evidence for it after. So the use of creation text, uh, Genesis creation text in the temple itself, we can find in the, the period after the exile. Now, Nibali has also noted all ancient temples rehearsed, the story of the creation, the establishment of mankind, the royal government of God upon this earth. Then they moved into the heavenly sphere and the theology associated with the worlds beyond. Ancient temples are built right next to bodies of water or uh, the Jerusalem temple is built over a stream that flows under it and it, uh, according to Ezekiel, it flows out in the direction of the, the Dead Sea. Even Latter-day Saint temples reflecting the same ancient pattern are built near, uh, close to, right by water. It is a remarkable thing. You, you think of uh, the a place right in the middle of the desert, the Las Vegas temple. Uh, you go and you, you look at uh, the inside of the Las Vegas temple. There is a little fountain of water there. The Hawaii temple, which is surrounded by water and is a, a tropical paradise, also has a spring in front of it. The Washington DC temple is flanked by a pool of water. So pools of water or streams itself are connected anciently with temples and we find it, nat uh, we find it among Latter-day Saint temples as well. Yeah, li yeah, as it were, living waters. Now, this next is on the Psalms, the concept of temple drama, the fall festival. And we continue. Yearly rites are carried out at the temple, and thus the temple plays a role in the liturgical calendar. Uh, during the New Year rites, texts are read and dramatically portrayed that uh, recite a pre-earthly war, the victory in the war by the forces of good. Now, I have to tell you, not all of these are Israelite. Some of them are non-Israelite, but we still see this in ancient Near Eastern temples. Um, uh, the victory in the war by the forces of good led by a chief deity, the creation and establishment of the cosmos, cities, temples, and the social order. The sacred marriage is often carried out at uh, this particular time. In ancient Israelite religion breathes a spirit that is very different from that uh, that was observed and maintained by the remnant of the Israelites, uh, the, that is the Jews who returned to Jerusalem and Judea after the Babylonian exile. What we see in, this, in the uh, Psalms is a mirror of a much older kind of religion. And uh, among the themes that we find in the Psalms are a deep interest in the temple. It is huge, trust me, the uh, Psalms are connected with temple worship inextricably. Uh, the Psalms also uh, reflect a, a keen interest in kingship, the kingship of God, the kingship of man, uh, an interest in Messiah, Moshiach, the anointed one, who is either, the, either a man uh, or God, creation and priesthood. So we have temple, kingship, messiah, creation, priesthood uh, with somewhat different shades of emphasis. emphasis. The Book of Mormon also shows an interest in the same things. Temple, kingship, messiah, creation, priesthood. The Book of Mormon is an account of a group of Messianic Israelites that made their way from Jerusalem to the, the New World. That is the record. It is a record of Messianic Israelites. Uh, Psalm 24 provides um, a powerful example of some of the themes of the Psalms, creation, the kingship of God, and temple. <clears throat> we shouldn't, we, uh, we shouldn't uh, think of the Psalms without thinking of the temple itself. It begins with God's creation of the earth, 
fall in the most venerable traditions of ancient cosmology. The earth is founded upon the seas, established upon the rivers. And, and then it contains what my colleague and friend, Don Aperi, calls Temple Entrance Hymns, what uh, the distinguished, uh, now uh, late Jewish scholar Moshe Weinfeld calls instructions for temple visitors, but which uh, we can call ancient temple worthiness or temple recommend questions. Basically, that's it. So we want to look at some of these. The question that is asked, first off, who shall ascend to the mount of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? This is a question. Who is worthy to enter into the temple? To which the response is, he who hath clean hands, which is ritual purity and a pure heart, which is ethical purity, who hath not lifted his hands to soul and divinity, nor sworn deceitfully, also ethical purity, after which a blessing is given. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. And we get this in Psalm 15 too. This is also a temple Basically, the question for a temple recommend the interview. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Who is worthy to enter uh, into the tabernacle of the temple? To which there is a response. He that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness, speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In his eyes an evil person is contaminated. It goes on and on with some of the requirements um, of, of ethical purity that individuals have to abide by in order to be able to enter into the temple to which a blessing is given. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Uh, and the last one is in Isaiah 33. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? That is, in the temple, who shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Again, the presence of God or in the temple, to which there is a response. He that walketh righteously, speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth, despiseth not the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding bribes, and it goes on and following uh, the other requirements is a blessing. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the mus munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. So that's a blessing. Now here we see, this is uh, written in Greek uh, at the partition that separates the <clears throat> court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles were permitted to, to enter and walk around, and uh, that uh, uh, area where only Israel, uh, Israelites, Israelite women, Israelite men were permitted to go. This is written in Greek just so that the individuals would be able to read it. It says in translation, no Gentile shall enter inward of the partition and barrier around the temper, temple. Whoever is caught shall be responsible to himself for his subsequent death. Now that's pretty harsh. I'm guessing mostly they just got tossed out. But uh, the understanding was, you need to understand, if you are uh, do this, the uh, maximum penalty will be death. So stay out if you're a Gentile. Pilgrimage is also associated with the, the, the temple. These festivals were festivals that were associated with the temple of the ancient Near East. In Egypt, uh, the Hapsad festival, uh, complicated. Uh, anyway, trust me, it took place at the temple in Egypt. Mesopotamian festivals also took place at the temples and the Israelite festivals, Sabbath, Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and uh, tabernacles took place in association, in association with the, the temple itself. Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles were, were all pilgrimage festivals. That means at least Israelite men were expected to, to come. Israelite women could come too. Only tabernacles was a time when uh, all Israelites, men, women, children, in extended families had to come to the sanctuary in Jerusalem. 
And just as a, a side note, we, we find in the Book of Mormon, uh, Mosiah chapters one through six, the story of King Benjamin's address. We need to understand that King Benjamin's address as taking place at the Festival of Tabernacles uh, at a time when uh, <coughs> the Benjamin is uh, passing on his responsibilities as king to the uh, <coughs> to his son Mosiah. Uh, now, just in this past week, we have uh, uh, we are uh, in, in, in this past week. Uh, is uh, the uh, Jewish festival of tabernacles. Uh, it takes place sometime right around the, the fall. A couple of weeks ago was the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Two weeks after that is the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm guessing Tabernacles probably continues for another day or two. And uh, at, at that point, according to the tradition, people get together, they renew their covenant, they, they receive the word of the Lord from a prophet and um, uh, promise to continue in maintaining their covenant relationship with the Lord. Again, interestingly too, general conference takes place right around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, when uh, uh, the individuals come in order to be instructed in the covenant by the prophets and uh, uh, as a way of making covenants with uh, the Lord himself. Yes, sister. But the, um, the cycle for the Israelites was in the Jewish people with the lunar cycle. That, that, that is true. It's, it's a kind of lunar solar cycle. Uh, the uh, lunar cycle had to do with a month of the year, but there was a solar year that they tried to, to keep up with and that they tended to. Uh, I am told that the uh, Jewish calendar gets in sync with the, the uh, Western or Christian calendar about once every 19 years, but in general, it, it still tries to keep track with seasons, uh, unlike uh, the Muslim calendar that is only lunar in character and is quite a bit shorter than the solar uh, seasonal year of uh, the Christians and Jews uh, in any event. But tabernacles, is a uh, uh, general conference is t time is like tabernacles a time for individuals to be able to, to come and to be instructed by the uh, prophets and uh, to receive uh, uh, the covenants uh, from him. The uh, yearly rites are carried out at the temple. Uh, the temple then plays an important role in the uh, liturgical calendar. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, during the, the New Year rites, again, this is the New Year rites uh, in Mesopotamia, not necessarily uh, in Israel, but what we find is not untypical of what we find, at least on a monthly basis in Israel. Texts are read dramatically portrayed that recite uh, a pre earthly word, the victory in the war by the forces of good led by a chief deity and, and, and in any event so the establishment of cosmos, cities, temples, and social order, that's Mesopotamia, but it reflects a, a, the character that we can also see in ancient Israel. Uh, the uh, covenant making is also associated uh, with the temple. Ancient Israelites celebrated the New Year festival in the fall of each year after their harvest and before the rainy season to celebrate the ingathering of the crops. Thus, it, is, it takes place right about fall time when uh, after which the rainy season begins and uh, it was much more than just a harvest festival at the time of covenant making, covenant renewal. Uh, the festival was a continuum of three sacred events that uh, taken together represented a time of personal communal and uh, symbolically eternal renewal, a time of creation 
and recreation. And beginning almost a century ago, um, some of Europe's most eminent Bible scholars taught that the ancient Israelites at the time of Solomon's Temple celebrated a New Year's festival. Um, but whether the, it was at the New Year at the fe Feast of Tabernacles, there was um, covenant renewal that took place uh, traditionally in ancient uh, Israel. The highlight was an eight-day covenant renewal, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, in which all of the people participated. In fact, when we see the requirements for individuals to uh, participate in the Feast of Tabernacles, every Israelite man, woman, and children were to come to the sanctuary, that is, to Jerusalem or to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was earlier. And similarly, and this is very interesting, when these people come to the temple, it, it's, it's not just men, it's men and women and children as extended families from the oldest to the youngest in order to be instructed and in order to renew their covenants. Um, a humbly introduced to Latter-day Saints a rediscovery of the ancient Israelite temple drama and at the time of Solomon's temple, a ceremony in the form of an operetta-like play was performed annually by the ancient Israelites as part of the celebration of their covenant renewing, uh, whether it's New Year or Feast of Tabernacles, uh, a time of covenant renewal. Um, Bible scholars believe that the Psalms, in their original order, were the text of ancient Israelite a temple uh, a drama and that the message was lost when they lost the temple could no longer perform the drama so what we see in the Psalms is reflective of um, uh, a tradition that was very ancient that is redolent of what we uh, Latter-day Saints have in our temple tradition but which likely was lost um, the uh, uh, covenants and ordinances of the temple drama were lost. They believed that to disguise the lost sound, the sounds were rearranged so they can no longer be read from front to back. Mm. <clears throat> Suggestions for the teachings and rituals of this drama remain scattered throughout the Bible, but they are, I'm guessing, mostly uh, hidden. What we um, can find are just hints and reflections of it. The theme of this drama is uh, the Savior's uh, atonement its power to preserve, enhance, and uh, perfect our eternal personalities. The king and queen are people representing them with the main actors in the drama. In fact, this, this reminds me very much of uh, the Hymn of the Pearl, which was extremely popular in the early church, which was very predominantly Jewish. The earliest church was overwhelmingly Jewish uh, in its representation. And the Hymn of the Pearl uh, has uh, a story of a king and queen um, who were the main actors in this uh, particular drama. Let me go back to that. The purpose of the drama was to teach each individual who he was, why he is here, and to do that in the context of uh, the atonement. And we can find these principles in the Book of Mormon, which is, after all, the uh, writings of Messianic Israelites, Israelites who had maintained that tradition of connection uh, with uh, messianic hope uh, with the expectation of the coming of a messiah. The ancient Israelite temple ceremony was a, cop uh, was a cornerstone of Nephite religion, the religion of messianic Israelite people. Its whole purpose was to bring people to Christ through an understanding of the atonement. And the last day of the festival is the time of the great feast it represents the, the millennial reign of the Savior. And, and for the, the people, it, rep, it symbolizes a return to the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life, the restoration of their garments of light, precisely what we find in the Hymn of the Pearl. 
uh, that I, I don't uh, have time to um, go into great detail about, but which is very much like this. Yes. Well, um, so the New Year, the Jewish New Year is Rosh Hashanah, and it's not like a New Year like we think of a New Year. It's actually the anniversary of God's creation of Adam and Eve. It's the calendar. It's God created Adam and Eve, so it's the birthday of humanity. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that that's probably a, a part of the, the uh, Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah. <clears throat> the, the, the annual um, events, uh, the, the, the annual ceremony for covenant renewal, I, I'm guessing was not Rosh Hashanah, that is, the, or um, the Day of Atonement, uh, but, uh, but, but the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Yom Kippur, you have uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is, uh, as a matter of fact, Yom Kippur is in uh, the uh, first month of uh, the uh, later Jewish year, and it is in the month of uh, Tishri, and uh, Sukkot also takes place in this first month, as does the Day of Atonement. But the um, uh, Feast of Tabernacles is a festival of covenant renewal and instruction and, uh, and receiving commandments from the prophet. And I, it, it may in its own way be a kind of uh, uh, New Year's festival. <clears throat> Yeah, so this temple drama, for the people, it, symbol, it symbolized their return to the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life, the restoration of their uh, garments of light and their being again in the presence of God. And it was used by Nephi prophets in the teachings and sermons that we find in the Book of Mormon. Again, let's just bear in mind the Book of Mormon is the account of Messianic Israelites Israelites who had a vision, a clear vision of the future coming of a redeemer and who will deliver them from their sins. The Book of Mormon is a temple text. Um, and this, uh, we should, it would require volumes. It would require a lot more lectures. I may have to, um, uh, uh, get you all signed up for my class so we could actually <laughs> take it. Uh, this is just a teaser tonight, but you, you want to sign up and then take the, the class from me. It's good, clean, fun in, in any event. Um, the teachings, the sequence of ancient Israelite temple drama. These people had a clear vision of what it was like, and yet this is the thing. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, but they realized that what they need to do up till the time of the coming of their Messiah is to observe the uh, law of Moses. They, they said, oh, we really would like the law of Moses to be fulfilled in the coming of Christ, but we still have to observe it. Sorry about all of that. Um, but uh, the... Uh, ceremony cleansing that we, we find the day of atonement was necessary uh, for the uh, cleansing for the Feast of Tabernacles that would follow. Uh, now, again, uh, the people had become clean. They could symbolically enter into God's celestial temple to participate in the reenactment of the premortal events uh, portrayed during the first scenes of the drama. Even, we find, during the period after the return from exile. They did uh, recite some of the Genesis creation accounts during the afternoon uh, sacrifice service. Uh, after Yom Kippur, they used the 11th to the 14th days to prepare for the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, they constructed tabernacles or booths, um, which it would either, either have been tents or could have been huts made of wood, tree branches and leaves as a covering. <clears throat> it's not as though everybody had a, uh, a tent or a pop tent, but they had some kind of temporary um, shelter that they could make for themselves. These tabernacles or booths were, were built near the city. Uh, the homes of individual families during the remaining eight days of this particular celebration. So. In fact, 
in contemporary Judaism, individuals do build their tabernacles if they have a home outside and they tend to, to live in it uh, a fair bit of time during the observance of the Festival of Tabernacles. Uh, the Festival of Booths for us, uh, just imagine this, blocking out all distracting, uh, distractions, entertainment activities completely, no television, no movies, uh, uh, no getting together with, uh, for fun, eight days, making our homes uh, a festival booth focusing on prayer, scripture study, temple attendance, full days, many days. Uh, the ceremonies may also have been performed in places other than Jerusalem. There had been small temples scattered throughout the country. In fact, throughout the Jewish world, there were other temples temples that were built not simply in Jerusalem, but among other places in Elephantine in Egypt. Also, they had plans for the construction of the temple Leontopolis, which is uh, in the Delta area in Egypt. If the uh, temple were too far away to get to, in a reasonable amount of time, they could go uh, to their own local temples whether in Elephantine, which is in up the, the river in Egypt or down in the Delta area. And at Nahum Haran, in his book, Temples and Temple Service in Ancient Israel, uh, observes, in addition to the 12 or 13 temples that we've listed so far, ancient Israel may have known some of their temples which have left no trace whatsoever in the Old Testament. There were plenty of sanctuaries for which reason the Levites uh, were scattered through all of the tribes of Israel so they could perform their uh, sacrificial rites on behalf of the people. And so now we're uh, out of uh, another place, but I did want to share with you one last thing. And this is about the temple that we have in Salt Lake. It's a reflection of the temple type. Uh, <clears throat> Brigham Young uh, said, this was uh, in 1850, uh, 1852, 1853, five, no, 1853, he said, five years ago, last July, I was here probably, in uh, Salt Lake at uh, the site of the temple and saw in spirit the temple not 10 feet from where we have laid the chief cornerstone. I have not inquired what kind of temple we should build. Why? Because it, it was represented before me. I have never looked upon that ground, but the vision of it was there. I see it as plainly as if it were in reality before me. So Brigham saw in vision the temple uh, and uh, he probably saw the outside of the temple and uh, if those uh, that uh, engaged in the building of the temple had uh, asked Brigham, uh, is it done right? He, he would have said, this uh, it's, uh, reflects beautifully what I saw in vision before. Anyway, we continue on from this. We see the uh, layout of Salt Lake City that is built on a grid uh, surrounding the temple is probably quite literally the organization of sacred space from a sacred point where the temple is. Everything radiates uh, uh, from around it to the east, west, north, and south. In fact, most of it goes pretty far south and uh, pretty far to the west, north, and east. Not quite so much, but symbolically, the temple was the center of uh, the uh, city of Salt Lake, the center where the saints, uh, around which the uh, saints could uh, gravitate. And here we see, uh, again, an image of the Salt Lake Temple and then some other temples. Which particular temple is this? Just uh, this quiz time. So for your, your, uh, final, uh, your final examination, which temple is that? St. George. The St. George Temple. Which temple is this? 
the Mantai temple that has the a winding stairway way going up, reflecting what we have in the, the Nauvoo temple. Which temple is this? The Logan temple. Which temple is this? Oh my goodness. The Provo temple, okay. And uh, the, the temple's a meeting place of heaven and earth. Andre Perot said about that the temple was a building let me see. Oh, oh my goodness, we are really running uh, out uh, against time. The temple is a building which the gods traversed to pass from their celestial habitation to their earthly residence. The ziggurat is thus nothing but a support for the edifice on top of the stairway that leads between the upper and lower worlds. You, you imagine the stairway that uh, Jacob saw in his dream is the, uh, the place that one goes in order to be able to get from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. And uh, the other stairways, which the God in answer to prayer is used in order to descend to the earth, bringing a renewal of life in all its forms. And this we find uh, in uh, Matthew 16, 19, uh, where Jesus says to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou, thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is the sealing power, a sealing power that at one time Israelite uh, prophets had. And it's a place of initiation. But now I, I, I need to, to rush. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, I, I hope I can, can do this again. Let me, let me just cite this. This is from um, a non lettered Saint writer, Harold W. Turner, uh, who uh, came from a Protestant background, but, but had written very intelligently and insightfully about uh, sacred space. Uh, in a book, From Temple to Meeting House, he has, at the end of his uh, uh, first chapter, as a final example representing a modern Western community, we refer to the great granite temple of the church, we should say of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at Salt Lake City, Utah. And here we see a beautiful image of the uh, temple surrounded uh, by clouds or fog. The plan for this was revealed in a dream to the then leader of the Mormons, Brigham Young. So establishing it as a divinely given sanctuary. And here we have an example of its layout, the Salt Lake Temple, uh, with successive upward uh, and inward um, movements. Although the public were admitted before its consecration to show that it uh, contained no fearsome secrets it then became distinguished from Mormon chapels and tabernacles by being confined to those deemed ready to receive the mysteries of advanced religious teaching. In no sense is it a Mormon congregational meeting place. It is not. Trust me, it is not. The meeting place, anybody can go. Temple, you have to have specific uh, requirements met to be able to get in. It is reserved for special functions, which all seem to have some cosmic reference, reference and how that's marvelous. In one chamber is the great copper tank where Mormons may be baptized and so united for all eternity with deceased non-Mormon ancestors, hence a great concern with genealogies. Not just that though, here we have the baptismal fonts in the Salt Lake Temple. Here also is a marriage room where unions regarded as holy through all eternity are celebrated. Here is a ceiling room uh, in the Salt Lake Temple. The splendid classrooms are each devoted to consideration of one of the great periods in cosmic history. The teaching, the murals help one to understand and meditate upon first the primeval era. Um, and so we have this uh, in the Salt Lake Temple. And the, uh, then the paradisal world of Eden, also in the Salt Lake Temple. And again in the Salt Lake Temple. So there we have it. And followed, followed by the disordered world as we know it. And there we have uh, the world room in the Salt Lake Temple. And there we have it animals fighting with each other anyway. 
I follow it by the terrestrial realm, bringing order from the chaos of the fallen world. And finally, the perfected celestial realm. And there we have the celestial room with Salt Lake Temple. And here we have uh, the Holy of Holies in the Salt Lake Temple. And I have to say, I, 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 I may be wrong, but I'm guessing that every Latter-day Saint Temple has a Holy of Holies in it. The Holy of Holies where the most sacred ordinances of exaltation are performed and where God reveals himself to man. And then we have it. The Salt Lake Temple also contains council rooms where the apostles and prophets of the church meet. So this is a council room where the uh, uh, First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve meet. Um, and in summary, plans for the construction of the temple are received through divine means. <clears throat> Point number two, a temple is not a meeting house. Meeting houses are available to all. Temples are accepted only to those deemed worthy. Uh, point number three, temples are places for uniting the living into eternal units uh, through uh, marriage uh, ordinances. Temples are also places for joining the living and the dead into eternal units, which is baptism for the dead. M may I note that Ancient Israel had a chance for becoming kings and priests, um, also queens and priestesses before the Most High God. They decided that uh, not to accept it and let uh, Moses uh, be their spokesman uh, uh, for God. And uh, after that, a uh, lower order of priesthood was also made available for them, which did not include uh, such things for which such as marriage uh, in the temple, which is a reflect of the uh, higher order of the priesthood. We, we go on, point number four, temples are places for instructing individuals about their place in the cosmic scheme. And uh, let me finish up by a, a quotation from Dr. Kevin's 1108. My name shall be here, that is, in the temple. I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this holy house. So, any questions? Thank you. I think I'm really fascinated because I'm part Native American with the Native American mm -hmm. connection and the Israelites. And I, um, I visited the Yucatan Peninsula and I've been to the Hopi Mesa and the Chichen Itza. The temple there is amazing and it's very similar in ways to the, the temples of ancient, you know, the ancient temples. So I just find it very fascinating and the people that, um, a lot of people reach to the highest level to get close to right, God, right. you know, but so. That, that is uh, very certainly true. Uh, even uh, uh, temples that uh, are not reflective, uh, let's say, of, of the Israelite tradition, still have uh, a, a similarity in terms of architectural type to what we find uh, in uh, ancient Israelite temple tradition or ancient Near Eastern temple tradition. Yeah, it's really amazing that Akhenaten Pueblo. There are so many places mm -hmm. that you can go visit and you can see these temples that, that replicate that. Same Exactly right. The, yeah. you, you can see uh, some typological similarities. Right. So I deduced that Moroni was a Native American prophet. <laughs> I think he probably was. They, they were all Americans, uh, Moroni as well. Yes, sister. Can you repeat the last thing that you said to us about when Moses was rejected by the people? That the yeah, Moses, uh, the, the people said, we will, we will only want to have Moses uh, speak or act as a mediator between us and God. You talk to God, God will respond to you, he can uh, speak to you. Uh, we would rather have that happen than run the risk of being consumed by God's uh, glory. They decided not to accept the opportunity of 
uh, receiving the higher priesthood with all of its blessings and, and opportunities, and they got a, uh, a lower order of priesthood that would allow them to be trained to ultimately receive a uh, higher order of the priesthood to. So that's when the temple ordinance was probably. Yes, it, as a matter of fact, it, it was. It was. Uh, it, it was in the time of Christ. The Melchizedek priesthood, I suspect, or I um, give as my opinion, was given to ancient Israelite prophets, but not generally until the time of Christ. In, let me say, to the Book of Mormon, the priesthood, uh, I think, was this, uh, the higher priesthood was bestowed upon Lehi. Lehi probably bestowed the same priesthood that is the Melchizedek or higher priesthood upon Nephi and all those who uh, only followed in their steps, but uh, it was not bestowed upon others that hadn't shown themselves worthy. And, but, but I have to say this too, the higher priesthood is a, a priesthood of higher ordinances and yet the, uh, even the Nephites were told you have to wait until the coming of Christ so that everything can be fulfilled and, and all of the, the blessings, including blessings of the temple, can be made available to the people. Uh, brother, yes? Yeah, I was just curious if you have any information about when Elijah was on the earth, if he had the um, yes, increased I think he probably did. I, I wonder how. But I, mean, I, I, I am guessing. I, uh, I give this as my opinion. He did have the higher priest, which probably may also have included uh, the power to uh, bind and to, to lose. That is the the authority. Uh, to bind families together. That was one of uh, the uh, blessings that was, uh, by powers that was bestowed upon uh, Elijah. Something that he restored in uh, the uh, Kirtland Temple in 1836. There are certain temples that have unique characteristics that others don't you visit all of them throughout the country that, that just come down to you in a way that some of the others go on. I mean, they all perform the same function, but I'm just curious in terms of architectural structure. That, that what really I find, uh, do, do you mind, m mean architecturally striking? Yeah, exactly. Uh, let, me, uh, let me see. The, I find uh, uh, architecturally striking the, uh, uh, the uh, temple where I received my endowments, the Oakland Temple, which was built to reflect uh, an uh, ancient South Asian tradition of temple, uh, temple construction. The, the, um, Panchayatana style, that is a style where you have one central, uh, one uh, central spire that is flanked by four somewhat smaller spires on each side. We see that in the Oakland Temple, the Salt Lake Temple itself is just gorgeous uh, um, in its own right. The Washington DC Temple I also find absolutely marvelous. Uh, but if, if you ask me, where and I feel that the spirit, the spirit moves strongly. It wasn't in any of those temples, I have to tell you. We, we were in uh, New Zealand a few years ago and we took occasion to go to the temple there. And normally when you go to the temple, you have a sense, um, I, I want to do this and then I think about doing some things after you get done. That, once I got there, I said, this is a place where sacred time actually prevails, where you don't think about going on to the next thing. You just think about enjoying the uh, spirit uh, that uh, manifests itself in the temple itself. That, that was a wonderful, at that point I said, I would like to be here and stay here just so I could have that uh, wonderful feeling. 
and the temple that we we went to again many years ago in just south of Stockholm in Sweden was was absolutely wonderful. I have to tell you, Sister Rex and I have been to over a hundred temples, uh, Latter Day Saint temples in the world. I have. I, I haven't actually said this, let, let me say this, so she may not be fully in agreement, but I have uh, a fevered uh, and a deep wish to be able to go to all of the Latter-day Saint temples, visit them all before uh, I kick the bucket. I, I, I really would like to be able to do that. <laughs> so. Do you know which one is a Moroni dressed in American clothing? I don't. Somebody told me it was Los Angeles. He's dressed like a Native American. I'm not like a Native American. I didn't know that. Well, in any event, Moroni was a Native American. Yes, yeah. brother. Dr. Dr. Riggs, uh, your presentation this evening reminded me of some of the uh, thoughts from a uh, British scholar, Margaret Barker. Yes. Who talked about temple theology and she studied mm -hmm. the Old Testament looking for evidences of temple worship. And I'm just curious to know sort of your feelings about her research. I, I'm in a, a very strong agreement with uh, what she says uh, about uh, the, the temple. I, I uh, have to say, what she says corresponds to uh, the, some of the Latter-day Saints understanding of the temple. And when it was explained to her just uh, how these overlapped, and she said, Joseph Smith must have uh, learned a lot about the temple to be so much in agreement with me. Well, the, in, in, in any of them, they tend to, to agree with each other, and uh, that makes them um, um, a great opportunity to understand the other principles. Yes. If anyone is interested, uh, Margaret Barker will be speaking at yeah. UAE next week mm -hmm. on the 12th in the uh, law school building. Mm -hmm. uh, which we may well uh, go to. She's, she's a good speaker, a wonderful person. She is and remains a, a very faithful denominational Christian, uh, but uh, she can see that she has friends among Latter-day Saints who love uh, her understanding of uh, uh, temples. Yes, uh, uh, Brother Dan. Uh, Stephen, we're so used to temples as buildings mm -hmm. because of uh, their sacred nature and their protected environment. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that ancient temples were buildings or were they cities of refuge? And what's the future of temples as cities, such as Jerusalem and independence, etc.? Uh, the, the temple can be seen either as a place of refuge, uh, which is separated uh, from others, which, uh, uh, in which uh, individuals are not uh, fully authorized may not enter, but it's possible uh, just uh, to, to think in terms of the prophetic views of a prophet such as Ezekiel. The, it was a, a holy uh, temple inside of our holy city itself, something that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls too. So uh, Jerusalem is a holy city and inside of it is the holiest site in Jerusalem, the, the temple, a place of refuge and a place that uh, those that are not authorized are not able to enter. Yes. Did you have another word? Cities of the Lord. Right? Yeah, that cities of the Lord. Cities, cities. Uh, and apparently Jerusalem is destined to be a city. Exactly. We, we find that in Ezekiel. We can also see it uh, in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls material, such as the Temple Scroll. It's, yeah, I think the temple is, um, the uh, outside of the temple is uh, what we are, the temple is what we aspire to be, and you know, the rites of the temple are what we aspire to be, the temple is the uh, place in between the world 
and uh, the telestial world, the world in which we now live, and the celestial realms, the temple is a kind of portal that would allow us to go from this world into the celestial realms. So, and yet, why don't I take this as the last, um, uh, with uh, many apologies. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, can the Jerusalem Temple was an Aaronic priesthood. Yes, it was. And the highest priest. Aaronic priest. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe you can tell us, uh, it was the last time we were here, it was interesting how they compared the, the tabernacle uh, on the desert to you know, with the celestial, terrestrial, and celestial uh, areas. I, I think what I, I did in, in the uh, first discussion that I had was show how the effects of the fall was, was overcome by entering into the tabernacle first from outside, as it were, the world into the holy place, which may well be the uh, terrestrial uh, world, and then passing uh, by the uh, cherubim entering into the Holy Holies, which represents the very presence of God himself. So the effects of Paul can be overcome. Man who is cast up from the presence of God into this lone and dreary world can enter from this world through the um, terrestrial, through the uh, rites of uh, priestly ordinance into the presence of God himself. So there we have it. Thank you so very much. I really enjoyed uh, having me able to, get, uh, to visit with you this evening and uh, talk with you about the temple, which I love. I really, truly love. <laughs>